Good morning. Today's scripture reading will come from John 15, 1 through 6. John 15, 1 through 6. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are a... You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Sun Valley Church of Christ, it is an honor to stand here before you this morning and get ready to preach Jesus. Preach love. Preach the the guidance that guided us here today and will guide us into eternity. And what a blessing it is to be followers, to be people who have submitted ourselves to his call, his word, his will, his worship, his work. Beautiful. But that's not the sermon. I want to welcome all our visitors today and, and, and hopefully you understand how grateful we are that you're here because, not because you're here, but because God's word is being preached while you're here. And this is a way for faith to come into action, Romans chapter 10. Faith comes from hearing the word of God and so we're glad you're here today because God's word is going to be preached. Members, glad you're here today because God's word is being preached, right? Grateful that uh, we have an opportunity to come together and share time together worshiping our God as one in Jesus Christ. What a blessing that truly is. And you know, that love thing, man, there must be something to it. God's really, God's really, you know, down on love, if that's the proper verbiage. I mean, he is love. And do you understand that his commands, both of them that we follow have to do with love? To love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. We get that. And then he said, if you do these two things, you fulfill all the law. And what a beautiful concept that is. All we have to do is love. You know, there was a Sunday school teacher that was uh, bringing the kids back into the auditorium after class one time. And she was asking the question as they were coming back, why do we need to be quiet when we're in services? And a little girl piped up in the back. She said, because everybody's sleeping. I wonder that sometimes, you know, how true that is. But I do say this, the world must be sleeping, you know, because they don't get this. This isn't resonating in their minds. It isn't, this isn't resonating in their lives. You know, we, we are here because God's message is being preached. It's being lived. You know, God is loved. Jesus has lived and the Holy Spirit has learned. This is what it's about. We're growing in our understanding of who God is, and that is deeping, deepening our understanding. And it's given us a foundation to each step we're more confident in taking. Not worrying about what lies behind, but pressing on. And understanding that I have more concern for Billy's interests than I do my own. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 said, Cub, why'd you say that? I didn't say it, Paul did. I'm just quoting him. This is the kind of love that gets a congregation to grow. This is the kind of love that's going to set the world on its ear because they don't get this kind of love. God knows, folks, how bad we need to understand love. He knew knew it so deep that he sent the Beatles to come and tell us. What the world needs now is love. He didn't send the Beatles. He sent Jesus. He sent our Savior, our Lord, our beloved Christ, the Holy One from God, to love us in a way that nobody else could. A way that would lead me out of the world, into the water, and into His grace. And that's what we are here today to celebrate. 
The beautiful idea that a God would love us that way. Now we could go home if that was the gist of the sermon, but it's not. It's only the tip of the iceberg. Because as we learn and we grow in this understanding of who God is, we're going to learn to grow in our love. Because this is what God wants from us. Philippians chapter 1, Paul prayed, you know, way back in, oh, I would say 67 A.D., Paul said a prayer for you. That's right. He said a prayer for you, Tom. He said, I pray that your love may abound still more and more. He didn't say, may your bank account continue to grow. You know, he said your love. Your love for God, your love for his creation, your love for his people, your love for his church, your love for his son. That love would grow so that you're able to discern what is right and what's wrong. You see what's wrong with the world today is they don't know what's right. Because they don't have a love deep enough to help them understand what they're doing is wrong. They have a pride so high that you can't tell them what they're doing is wrong. But you and I are married, hear me, we're married to Christ in this love. In this love that God wants to show the world. As Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, we've covered this before, but this has been weighing on my heart because I've been talking with some, some of us and, you know, marriages struggle when we struggle with the idea of love. There's no other reason. You hearing me? There is no other reason why marriages struggle except that they're struggling with the concept of love. They don't get it. We're not getting it. And, and I'm not saying I get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to get it either, so don't beat me up after the sermon, okay? What I'm saying is I'm learning. I'm growing. And it's making my marriage better. It's making my relationship with my elders stronger. And even with their wives stronger. Right, Becky? <laughs> yeah, even if she don't cook me fish and all them good things. That's part of the relationship. It doesn't give the whole of it. But the whole of it is that we're learning, we're growing, and we're understanding God on uh, deeper, deeper ideas. This is what, you know what, Jenny, if you leave here with nothing more than this, you're leaving with a gold mine, right? And this is it. God loves us to make his power known. Do we get that? God loves me so much that he gave his life for me so that I could follow him and become a Christian, someone who loves God with all our, my heart, mind, and soul, and I am going to follow my Lord at all costs, and that makes his power known. When we talk about love from Ephesians chapter 5, I want us to understand that love pursues the purity of sanctification. I know there's a lot of words here, but I want us to dig in deep. This is good stuff, right? Why, why does a husband, now, the idea of marriage in the first century is a lot different than what it is today, you know, because women were really not much more than property, so they didn't really have much to say uh, in a marriage situation, so a lot of the commands, and I've talked to some of us about this, a lot of these commands are to the men, and then the woman that says, respect your husband, you know, it gives all these men, the, the men, all these commands to do, and then it goes, women, respect your husband, but you, you, and, and, and subject yourselves to your, your husbands, yeah. But people, our minds are bigger than that. We understand that, you know, times change, and I'm glad because, believe me, you women are much more than property. So these commands are not about husbands and wives. They're about the relationship to each and every one of us to be strong in these. And what we do in these relationships is we're pursuing the purity of sanctification. Do we understand that? When I ask my wife to marry me, I put her in a place that nobody else can be. That's sanctification. And my life is about pursuing the purity that why once that better never go away. So I want to pursue it. I want to promote the persistence of sustenance. In other words, I, I want, don't give me milk all day long. I mean, I'm a milk fan. It does the body good, right? I get that. But I want meat. I want things that are going to sustain this relationship. Things that are going to make it stronger. I just don't want to stay together, people. I want us to grow together. You understand? It's much more than just staying together. 
It's growing together. And we're going to learn about that. And we're going to talk about pressing on to the prize of success. Do you understand the beauty of it? The prize? And, and not only marriage, but our relationship with Christ too. There's, there's a lot of meat that we've packed in this lesson today. So hopefully you've come hungry. Because one thing that we, I think we lose sight on is the idea of purity. The beauty of being pure. You know, there's no other way to describe it than adultery. Adultery is impurity to a marriage. And so I'm pursuing the purity. I want this relationship to stay pure. I don't want nothing to come in and make it dirty. It's kind of like filling up a bathtub. I remember the good old days when you used to have to fill up your bathtub. Remember that? Yeah, sometimes you had to take the stove, uh, water off the stove to come and put it in there because the water was cold. But I mean, and I'm terrible about it. You know what I mean? Because like I'd fill that whole bathtub and if there was a floater in it, pull the plug because I ain't getting in it. I mean, a little floater. My sister's like, shut up and get in there. So the mom would grab me by the head and plunge me in there. You know what I mean? I don't like floaters. I don't want to get in a bad tub with floaters in it, right? Hey, you know what that taught me? The purity of God's love. There ain't no floaters in it. There ain't nothing impure in it. I don't want nothing impure in it. So what do I need to do as a person that doesn't like floaters, right? I got to keep the floaters out. I don't want floaters in there. So what do I need to do? Well, in verses 25 through 27, Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Man, that is purity right there. You know, woo, Mr. Eugene, you probably agree with me on this. When you saw your wife, Walking down that aisle, there was nothing more holy, nothing more pure, nothing more sanctified in all the world. I mean, it's like Adam. Could you imagine when God created Eve? I bet he thought, that's the most beautiful wo woman in the world. Well, it was because she was the only woman in the world. But yeah, you know what I mean? That is the most beautiful. And that, man, if you didn't think that when that woman was coming down, there was something wrong here. See? The idea is the beauty of being pure. Oh, man, that picture. I mean, I still remember it because we had a unity candle behind us and it was on fire. My wife was an hour late to the wedding. Yeah, can you believe that? And so the unity candle caught on fire, the whole thing. And so I'm standing looking at my wife and I'm starting to feel heat behind me. And the preacher's behind me trying to put the fire out. I'm saying, let the fire burn, she's coming in. Woo! Well, I remember that day, and I ain't lost that. And somebody said, well, go. no, it ain't going away. It ain't going away. Her arm may be a little hurt today, her shoulder, and she may not be 100% physically well, but to me, that's the most beautiful woman in the world, and that don't go away. You can't wash it away. You can't burn it away. You can't talk it away. Now, I know there's other beautiful women in this building and in this world, but none like that. Why? Because that's sanctification. That's the purity of sanctification, right? Look at the pattern of love. Look at it. So that, Paul writes, so that, in verse 26, so that, I mean, those are words. What are words, Cub? Yeah, so that means in order for sanctification to take place. If I didn't see that beautiful woman the way I did that day, then the sanctification would have never have taken place. She's just another woman walking down the aisle. These are things that sometimes we don't catch. The pattern of that love is God sent his only begotten son. We love that person. We, we love that uh, savior that he would give himself up. He gave his life. And do, you, do you understand that word? He gave himself up. It ain't like, you know, we used to play hide and seek, you know, and say, okay, I, I give myself up. Oh, I'm caught. No, he gave himself into the hands that were going to crucify him. Are you hearing me? 
I can't even give myself to the hands of a Cardinal fan. Especially this afternoon because the Broncos are playing them, right? But the idea is he gave, him, oh, he gave himself up into the hands of the enemy. He, why? So that he could sanctify us. Judy, he did it so you could be sanctified. Somebody set apart. As beautiful as that woman walking down the aisle. Oh, that day's going to come. Revelation talks about it when we get to go to the wedding feast. We get to be married to the groom. Oh, the purity of that. The purity of that sanctification to take us out of the world and, and put us in a special place with God, to cleanse us, to remove that stain, that ugliness of flesh and sin, and all those things that once made us ugly have been removed. Because God doesn't see tub. He sees tub crucified. And it's no longer tub who lives. But Christ living in me. That's sanctified. Washing. Keeping me completely cleansed. To wash that away. The purpose of that love. Was that this could take place. Why did God do? So he could look at us. Right Sarah? He could look at us and say. You are beautiful to me. That song. You are so beautiful. Remember that song? Ooh, that used to send chills down my spine. Because you know how he said. To me, I don't care what the world says, but to me, you are beautiful. And I tell you what, Rick, I look in the mirror and sometimes say, man, I don't say this to you, I say it to me. But you're about the ugliest thing I've seen in a long time. But you know, God says you are beautiful to me. Because that's what he did. He purified me. He cleansed me. He washed me away from all this ugliness. And you beautiful woman, like, you know, Tracy's, you know, uh, my wife. He's, well, that ain't such a big deal. But to me, being beautiful to someone, whoo, you got my attention. Because I've tried and I just can't get there. But to my God, because he doesn't see all these impurities, that he doesn't look at this, then he knows why he did what, so he could look at me and see me differently. And look at the power of this love to present. Do you know what that means? To... <laughs> She made it down the aisle, right? And she stood with me. Not behind me, not in front of me, not below me, not above me, but with me. That's what present means. We are going to stand with Christ, hand in hand. Woo! That is, I'm telling you what, if that don't put shivers in your spine, you ain't got a spine. That just, that just, Ooh, that just hits me hard. Holy and blameless. You know, no blemishes. Nothing that would cause us to retract. No, nothing, the things that would cause us to get away. You know, but we are going to stand with him as holy and blameless. Because life is about pursuing the purity of that sanctification. People, I hope I'm leaving that in you. Oh, Carolyn. David, Ooh, nothing better in the world than that man. You know, of course, I love him because, man, on a hot day, he's a great shadow maker. You know that? I could stand this too cool weather. What's, what's it like up there? He's sweating like a hog. You know what I mean? And I'm down here in the cool weather. <laughs> but this is the idea. God has great places for us and the beauty of that sanctification, the purity of it. People, this should be life's pursuit. I mean, our goal as Christians is to be this kind of love. You know, when somebody said that'll go away, no, it won't. It don't go away. It grows. It don't go. It grows. And it keeps on growing. You know, it's kind of like these people that exercise all the time. You know, they're always counting those steps and they're always exercising. You know, to me, I get the most exercise of my day from shaking my head in disbelief. I, I'm just so amazed at how hard the world tries to get the church off off course do you see that how hard the world tries to get the church off course just shake my head in disbelief God sent us a love so pure so wonderful that when we embrace it we are set apart from the world they don't even recognize it oh they do recognize us but in a different way because now we are people that want 
something out of life. We want to be what life is about. And so we want to promote the persistence of sustenance. We want life to have a meaning, God's meaning. And that only comes through God's power. Sustenance, when I talk about sustenance, I'm talking about like, you know, we've had some men's breakfast, we have some uh, young at heart dinners and stuff, and we have biscuits and gravy sometimes. And gravy's good, woohoo, love it, don't get me wrong. Boy, you put some sausage in that stuff, now you got me, right? And that's what, that's what we're talking, sustenance is that meat in the gravy. Gravy's good, but it's even better with meat. And life is good, but we can't lose sight of what makes life good. What is it that gives meaning? If we look at our Bible, let, let us look at verses 28 through 30. He says, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. That's me. You know? He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. So we start seeing what the, the, the sustenance behind all this. Let me show you some things. You know, life is, is it, it must be edified to be verified. You understand? Life cannot sustain itself. It needs to be strengthened. It needs to be encouraged. It needs to be built up. No, 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 don't go looking out in the world and say, they ain't doing it. Well, that's them. But let me tell you, they don't have life. They have existence, John 10, verse 10, but they don't have life. This life that God gives us, it needs that edification. It needs to be built up. And so one thing that we can get from this is that love never loses focus. It never forgets. It doesn't uh, forget why we're here. Husbands ought to love their wives. What does that mean? Well, you know, Gary, you might want to love Judy this way. I don't know. It's up to you. But no, he's saying that marriage decision you made a long time ago. How long has it been now? 46 years now, something like that. Go to, that however long ago it was, remember it because it don't go away. You owe that decision 46 years ago to love your wife this way. If that decision to you still means something. You young people. Hear me, when you got people courting you or wanting to go out with you, wanting to date you, this is a great verse to say, this is my standard by which I go by. I want somebody to love me this way. You know, and if somebody loves me just because of my looks, well, they're smart, but they're not deeply loving me the way that God wants me to be loved. Right? Don't lose focus. Don't, don't forget about what life's about. And then when he said, no one hates his own flesh, what was he talking about? Well, nobody wants to live in misery. You know what I mean? When people hate their flesh, they live in misery. We don't do that. We don't, we don't want to live in misery. We don't want to live uh, uh, apart. We want to do things that bring happiness to give this life, this marriage, this relationship with our God, with Christ Jesus, something that is sustenant, something that is strong, something that's going to keep it growing. Verse 29, he talks about it. For no one hated his own flesh, he nourishes it. What does that mean? Well, love never loses its drive. I want it to stay strong, so I nourish that. What does that mean? I provide everything that's needed for maturity. I want this love to keep growing. So I provide everything that I can. I want to make sure that I am nourishing it. I want to make sure that I am cherishing it. Okay? And cherishing is simple. Love always brings the warmth of deep care. That's what the word cherish means, bring in warmth. Miss Cheryl, you know what that means. You know the difference between cold love and warm love, don't you? Yeah, I think we all do. A love that will take you in its arms and comfort you. And this isn't just for husbands, folks. Sometimes we men, as strong and as tough as we think we are, we need comforting sometimes. And there's nothing more comforting than a loving wife arm around you, holding you, reminding you how much you're loved how special you are, being held close on a cold night. 
Yeah, when your heater goes out and you're shivering in, in, under the blanket and, and, and your wife's a couple of feet from you and, and you start shivering and you think, ooh, maybe, maybe if I put my arm around her, oh, and then she puts her arm around you, woo, turn the fire on. Yeah, because it's love. It's warm in here now. In fact, we might want to hit that air conditioner now, right? Woo, that's, some that's what we're talking about. This love never dies. This love, it, it, it's sustenance. It's, it, it's what puts that heat in there. Now, I, you know, I, I, I've dealt with relationships that don't have that electric blanket type of atmosphere. And so when those hugs are there, well, I'm still shivering. <laughs> not very warm right but those are the kind of things that fall apart see and we're Christians we say no I don't want that to happen so I need to know my wife I need to know my husband I need to know what keeps that fire burning I need to know what keeps that you know because it's gonna get cold one day and I'm gonna need that little warmth on me you know what I mean so I want to make sure that's always ready to fire up right so people let's not lose focus Let's not lose our drive, and let's not lose our identity. Look at verse 30. Because we're members of his body, we are one. We are one with Christ. We're not two individuals, we're one. That's our identity. My identity is not in the world anymore. My identity is in Christ. And in Christ, that fire never goes out. It never goes away. This is the love that God sent to us, a love that keeps us holy. A love that keeps us pure, you know. A friend one time was <laughs> talking about he went to the Hallmark store, right, to find a card for his wife, and he was lingering around in the in the, in the aisle and he was looking through all the cards. And finally, the Hallmark attendant came in and said, "Sir, is there a problem? You've been here a long time." He goes, "Yeah, I can't find a card that I think my wife will believe." Ooh, a card that my wife will believe. Think about that. If our words are just words, then we're not believable. It's when we have sustenance. When, 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 when we're pursuing that, that, that sustenance that, that, that the meat gives us, the, 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 the drive of it. This is what keeps love going. This is what keeps congregations together. This is what keeps marriages together. When we're having this kind of mindset, I'm telling you what, folks, our, our words are easier to believe when we're walking in love. You know, and we want those words to be believed. So what do we do? Well, we press on. We want to press on to the prize of success. Now, there is a prize in this, you know. I want us to look in our, our, our Bibles. And I want us to look at verses 31 and 32. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, if you really want my opinion, nah, we're not even going to go there. The mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Okay, so he says, I'm giving you a marriage analogy through Christ and his church. All right? And, and, I want us to get some points here. Our success comes in remaining one with Christ. You see? Because when I separate from Christ, then marriage has no meaning. It has no value. It doesn't really, you know, weigh on the value system for me. There's other things more important. There's other things more valuable. There's other things I would rather do. But this isn't what Christ had in mind. So when we talk about it, we Think about the success. I want to break this down a little bit. For this reason. So there's success in, in the reason, you know. See, we've been trained by the world's love. Now, the world loves us when they get what they want from us. But the minute they stop getting what they want from us, some of you parents understand this, they quit loving us. You know, they kick us to the curb. You ain't no good for me now. What have you done for me lately? You know how it goes. That's why. We find success in the reason. And I'll say, girl, why did I marry you? No, I know the reason. There's, there's success in leaving the world, as, as, as Paul wrote and quoted for us. 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. There, there's, there's success in that. The world loved us for what it wants. Now we left that love for the life that uh, the love that Christ gives us in this life that is eternal. There's success in becoming one with Christ. And if you don't know how to do that, please read John 17. The oneness prayer. I want my church, this is Cubs version, don't quote me, but I want my church, people who believe in me and the apostles, to be one as you, Jesus is speaking, as you, Father, and I are one. You don't know how to be one? There you go. How one is Jesus and God? That's how one we should be. That's how one husbands and wives should be. And Satan uses everything to break that one into two, including our kids, including our family. That's why we leave mother and father. Not that we say, bye, mother and father, I don't want to see you no more, but the idea that you are no longer the decision makers in my life. Me and my wife are one, and we make these decisions together. So we have this great idea of being one in Christ Jesus. And then look at this, the prize. Here it is, folks. The prize is in verse 32. This mystery is great. But I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. The prize is that we get to live this life. The mystery has been revealed. Oh, and he said, yeah, it was once hidden. Nobody understood it, but now you get this mystery. You get to live this life. What a pride. Husbands, if you have a wife that's living this life, don't you have a prize? Wives, if you have husbands that are living, ain't that a prize? This is the prize of life. This is the whole idea. This is what's behind that nutshell. We live in subjection to his way, truth, and life. We live in love and we live in sanctification. We're no longer bound to the world. Now we broke free. Now we are one with Christ Jesus. You know, we need the Lord to fix our lives. They're broken. And when we understand they're broken, we know where to go to get it fixed. Little girl was watching her dad one time out in the farm, out on the farm, fixing the tractor. The tractor kept busting. He was always out there fixing that tractor. And the girl asked mom, what happens to old tractors when they finally stop working? And mom said, well, someone takes them and sells them to your dad. You know, I've had cars like that, right? That old devil, he wants to keep bringing us that old life. That old broken, no good for nothing life. But God gave us something that is more beautiful than anything we'll ever have. And that's eternal life. And as the world lives in their demise of their hopes and their dreams, we can rejoice in the life that God has given us, folks. God's love will work for us if we'll let that love work in us. It will work for our favor. Use your life to pursue the purity of sanctification. Understand it. Know what it is. I mean, we could have spent two hours on these points alone, but I know we're pressed for time. We got better things to do. No, we don't. No, we don't. So when we leave here, don't think we know it all. We got a lot more to learn. But we do pursue it, and we promote the persistence of sustenance. We want meat in our life. We want our life to have meaning, folks. And we get that, and we want, we want to be longing for the nourishment that goes with a good and strong life. And folks, I want you to leave here with this in your mind. Never stop living his life as a reward. The prize is that you get this life. And I want to encourage you today, if you're here, and you haven't started this life. Because really it starts when you're born. Not physical birth, Jesus said, but born again. Waters of baptism, washing away your sin, raised to walk in the newness of what life? The life that God has given us. Folks, that's yours. It's available to you today. 
if you've not been baptized into Christ, I pray you'll make that decision and start this life. But I also want to encourage those of us that have started this life. Let's not forget that life is a pursuit. It's pursuing the things that God wants for us. And I know you young people, you, you don't want to hear all these things about what we do and have to do and have to. No, it's not about have to. It's about get to. That old Satan, he's trying to fog your mind to think that anything out there makes life good. There's only one that makes life good, and that is Christ Jesus. If there's something in your life that Satan's trying to pull you away from the body of Christ, the only way to win against Satan is through Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Jesus is the answer. Don't let anything happen. Don't let anything pull you away. Today, if we can help you, maybe it's lead you to the waters of baptism or say a prayer with you to keep you strong in your faith. We'll do that for you today if you'll let us. Please take this opportunity now to come forward as we stand and we sing.